in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. After the festive break, must say, it's nice to be back. Coming up on the programme this week, we'll be finding out about the increase in calls to domestic violence helplines. Unfortunately, there is still a stigma around uh, domestic violence. This hasn't changed a lot, but um, people are now more aware of their, of their rights, and uh, they are more aware that there are services around that they can ask for help. The Cyprus Freshwater Angling Association is organising a clean-up of the dams. Pieces of uh, cars or batteries of trucks, it's, it's unbelievable what you find in, uh, in the dams. And BirdLife Cyprus invites you to download an app which can help them in the fight against illegal bird trapping. We receive the GPS coordinates of the incident that they've reported to us and we then report it to the competent authorities, safeguarding, of course, the anonymity of the person who's reported this to us. Calls to a support line for victims of domestic violence leapt by almost 50% last year. So I've come to the safe house run by SPAVO. That's the Association for Prevention and Handling of Violence in the Family, where I'm joined by Yota Grigorio and Anastasia Sava. Ladies, a 50% jump is huge. Now, I'm interested to know whether you think that's because there's more violence going on in the family or because the years of campaigning to bring this out into the open mean that more people are happy to call your helpline. More people feel safer uh, calling the line and um, talking about uh, this issue. Also, the line operates now 24-7. So we think this is another reason for... Uh, because a lot of calls presumably do come in during the nighttime hours, I suppose. Is that an, a time when you expect more calls because it's often the time that incidents happen? Uh, to be honest, we didn't analyse exactly when is the peak hour of the phone calls. But, uh, of course, more calls come because it's 24 hours. And the association now is more known. Uh, people know us because of the campaigns, because of the projects that we run uh, throughout the years, uh, the publicity of the issue. So um, people feel more safe to talk about this. And what about the stigma that used to certainly be attached to this issue? Is it that, I know 90% or thereabouts of the victims who call you are women, and mm -hmm. obviously the other 10% must be men, I guess, but... Is it because women feel that they won't be condemned anymore? They were always not only the victims, but also classed as, in a sense, the perpetrators, bringing this upon themselves. Has that changed in Cyprus? Unfortunately, there is still a stigma around uh, domestic violence. It, this hasn't changed a lot. But um, people are now more aware of their, of their rights and uh, they are more aware that there are services around that they can ask for help. So more people are calling in, but uh, not so many people want to come in for an appointment or want to come to the shelter because of the stigma, because they're not ready to, to speak out and, um, and say their name and say what's been going on you know, in public. So they prefer to speak anonymously in the line and get some information and get some support. But um, the majority of the cases do not uh, go on and ask uh, for, for more... Um, or report it to the police. Yes, or report yes. it to the police. Women are still afraid to report this to the police uh, because in many uh, services, the way uh, they react to them is not always so supportive. And uh, this is uh, an obstacle we're trying to, to face lately. Okay, yeah. so most of the callers then are really just calling you to see if there's somebody there they can talk to, but they're not yet at the position, and I presume it often takes many calls before mm -hmm. they get to the position mm -hmm. where they may say, I need your protection and I want to report it to the police. Exactly. Yes, exactly, and also we have people calling for years and they still haven't made the choice to come and see us uh, or to come to the shelter or 
to ask for um, psychological support in person. If they did ask for psychological support and they came here, presumably without the abuser's knowledge, mm -hmm. what could the psychologist do for them? Uh, we try to, to look at their needs and make up a plan on how to proceed. There is help uh, regarding empowerment and, and we psychoeducate uh, on the violence and uh, work on the guilt. Support them to uh, what they need to do next. It's like recognizing the violence and taking steps for their well-being. Also, we, um, we provide sessions to perpetrators, not only to victims. So perpetrators are also welcome on the line and also for appointments. How many of the perpetrators do you get who are willing to talk to you and admit that they do this? Not many. Not many, yeah. Uh, more on the phone than on appointments, but... Um, there is an increase now, so this is uh, positive for us because whereas before there were none, now there are some. So we see it as a positive uh, change. change. Yeah. So there are some people out there who are abusing their wives or their families and who recognize that they have a problem and this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they need help because they're uh, considerate about their families and wanted to keep their relationships, so they are motivated to do something, some of them. Some of them feel like they're the victims and they call in. So we help them to face and recognize their uh, behavior. And what is the bottom line on that sort of thing? Is it that they just sort of something snaps and they lose control or is it based very much on the fact that perhaps they were abused as children? It can be that they were abused as children, it can be that uh, they cannot control their emotions, so it's easier for them, for them to act out it, rather than control their emotions and calm down in a different way. It has to do with values, uh, how they grow up, and what they believe about what is a, a relationship mm -hmm. and um, their role. In Which the brings us to yeah. education, because yes. I know that when you publish these figures about mm. the increase in calls mm. to the helpline, one of the things that came up was the importance of putting into our school system some education on perhaps family values, mm. on relationships, on the way to treat the opposite sex, mm -hmm. or your friends, or your children, or mm -hmm. whatever. And what is a healthy relationship? Uh, this is something that we do. We do offer work workshops in uh, schools, and uh, helping uh, students to realize and recognize how they can build healthy relationships. What's the reaction you get from the kids who attend the workshop? What age are they, first of all? Depends. It's from uh, can be all different ages. We we go to primary schools or high school, or even to um, to universities. To universities. But uh, these workshops are very important for uh, much younger uh, children, yes. like in uh, schools. It, it's easier primary. to change values from the beginning when yeah. they are started to being formed, yeah. rather than later on. At, uh, yeah. Right. And you can really see the stereotypes that are being formed uh, in a very young age. Like uh, what is the role of a woman or a man and what a relationship means. So you can really see how they are educated through families on these issues. And it's important to have uh, gender equality because uh, where there is gender inequality we see that there is um, more violence and specifically uh, violence towards women and also women are not uh, are more hesitant to ask for help because of the stereotypes and because of this inequality. And let's talk finally about the safe house that we're sitting in. Now I remember coming to its inauguration several years ago now. Mm -hmm. Just how is it going? Is it full? How long do people stay? How's, how's it doing at Spavo yeah. House? Yeah. Uh, now we're almost full. We have one uh, room available. We, it's a bigger house now, so we can um, um, okay. protect, accommodate uh, more people, up to 21 persons. And um, people can stay from six to eight weeks, but depending on their case, depending if they are, if they are still in danger, they can stay longer, or if they are not uh, able to move on. 
And, um, How do you help them move on? Because again, if they've been in a violent relationship, Cyprus is such a small place, it's very easy mm -hmm. to trace people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we help them to get in contact with other services that can help them, such as the social welfare office and, or the police uh, or a lawyer. So they proceed legally to get some uh, protective orders and also, uh, there are many programs in the shelter um, designed for them to, um, to empower them, to, for the women to look at their role as a mother and how to get um, again in contact with, with their children because of the violence this uh, makes difficult for them. And also for the children on how to protect themselves and how to ask for help once they leave the shelter. It's also safe uh, staying here because you were asking about this. It's, uh, we have alarms all over the place and, and uh, we have some rules to protect these women. They can, of course, uh, go to work, their children go to school, but uh, we do have some rules that can secure them from uh, danger. But the bottom line is that it's probably good news that more people, 50% more people, have been calling the Spavo helpline. It means that they are more aware of the fact that there are people out there who are able to help them. So ladies, just tell us what is the number that people who find themselves in a difficult position with uh, violence or abuse at home should call? It's 1440, it's free of charge and it's 24 hours open, so they can call any time. We've been talking to Yoda Grigoriu and Anastasia Sava from the Association for Prevention and Handling of Violence in the Family. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. If you follow any of the Cyprus Facebook pages, you'll have seen that there's been, actually also in the mainstream media, quite a hoo-ha about the rubbish that's being dumped in our very precious dams. Well, the Cyprus Freshwater Angling Association is going to come to terms with it. They've organised a clean-up at one of the worst affected dams in Yermasoya, just north of Limassol. Joining us to discuss the issue are Pandelis Iona and Fivos Papa Christoforou. Fivos, tell us first of all about how you came to be aware of the problem because as freshwater anglers and I do that too, I didn't tell you this before I am well aware of the trash that gets left behind when people go do a spot of fishing in the dams have a picnic and don't take their rubbish home with them but this is much worse than that isn't it at Yerma Soya? It's definitely much worse than that, that and uh, I think the problem I revealed when uh, the water level dropped so you could see all the rubbish left in the dam and uh, it's important to say that it's not only in Yermasoya but it's in several dams of Cy around Cyprus that uh, the same problem occurs. The thing with the Yermasoya is that it's uh, so close to Limassol and so many people visit the place. There's more traffic than in some of the yeah. remote mountain dams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there is yeah. a problem in those as well. There is. And I'm wondering what, as the Angling Association, you can do about it, because certainly in the more remote dams, it's almost exclusively, is it not, people going fishing. They're, they're off the beaten track. You have to want to go to some of the places way up in the mountains. This is the thing. I think people are not aware that it's uh, actually not fishermen who are polluting the dams. For sure, some people that uh, like to be called fishermen, uh, we, it definitely differentiates our uh, position from those, those guys. They do leave uh, garbage behind, obviously. But uh, because we are doing uh, every year, like uh, cleaning in a, in a dam, not the same dam every year, we come up with uh, foundings like... Uh, air conditioning units or television or pieces of uh, cars or batteries of trucks. It's, it's unbelievable what you find in, uh, in the dams and it's definitely not anglers uh, that are going to carry these things and leave Okay, there. so we're talking there about fly tipping actually, which is a different thing altogether. Pandelis, let me come to you. Tell us about this clean-up that's happening in the next couple of weeks and how people, because it's not obviously just your members, you're hoping, I think, that a bit like when we have the Let's Do It Cyprus clean-up of everywhere, that people will come and join you. How can they get in touch? What should they do? First of all, I have to say that our association every year organizes clean-ups. 
So this year we decided to organize this cleanup relatively early just because of the publication of this issue. So everybody is welcome to join us on the 21st of January at Germasoya Dam. They can send us a message for more information at our email or at our Facebook page. How long will it take? What are you expecting them to do? They'll turn up at a particular time in the morning? Yeah, or we will start at all day or what? half past nine in the morning. And it's approximately take two hours. Usually, most of the people, after the first hour, get tired. Get tired so and, but we'll try to clean for two hours. And it's a big area, isn't it? Because, I mean, you, yeah. you're hopefully going to spread out around the dam. And you mentioned that the water level is now pretty low, but you've also got to be pretty careful if you're going to walk uh, sort of on the muddy floor yeah. of yeah, the yeah. dam, if haven't it, you? Because particularly yeah. in some dams, I've tried that, getting when it's low to go and fish near the wall, yeah, that, and you've got to be very careful because well, you can get stuck. We, we are going to have a look prior to the time that uh, we're going to meet at Akrunda Park, just uh, letting people know where we all meet, and there we're going to spread, like you said. We are not hoping that we will clean up the whole dam. It's, it's impossible. It would take us, uh, like, days. But we will try to clean up uh, as much as we can. I would like to say that uh, the association's purpose is to organize, like, fishing meetings and, uh, you know, gatherings and promote fishing and catch and release and everything. We are doing this because we know how important it is not only for fishermen, but uh, for the whole communities. So people that are invited already are like communities around the dam, organize uh, groups. Will the scouts and the girl guides help you, for example? Uh, actually, we had uh, the, our last cleaning was with uh, scouts, and they really loved it. They enjoyed it, and we cleaned up a big part of Calabasas Dam, and then uh, we showed them some uh, fishing techniques. We won't have the chance to do it this Sunday because the purpose is different. But um, scouts, the university, all people who can participate, they really should. I mean, this is the water we are drinking, this is the water we are uh, washing with, uh, we are washing our vegetables, anything that goes on our table. You know, it's, it's really serious. And uh, with this action, it's not so much about cleaning the whole dam, but uh, it is to push things forward, bring local authorities and uh, private and public sector together. So all of us will sit on the same table and try to find a solution for this problem. Well, and the other thing, of course, is awareness. And my total lack of understanding about a very cavalier attitude here in Cyprus to the countryside in general. People throw things out of car windows. As I said, they go for picnics and leave all their plastic rubbish behind. What is it that we need to do, do you think, to make them realise that this is something that is so beautiful if it's looked after? It, it's really beautiful. Uh, I don't know if Pandelis wants to talk about it. I, I, I I definitely in my opinion, education is the most important. Yeah. It's the key to deal with this issue. So our association, especially the last two years, tries to educate children and to show them, first of all, to show them that we have very beautiful places in our country. Then to tell them how important it is to protect them. And except for that, from this, we promote them the cash and release mentality. Let's mentality. Say, yeah. Basically working with uh, groups of young people uh, latest years, like scouts, like we said, or schools. We have uh, an annual uh, fishing day organized in Athalassa Park. You really have to join our uh, Facebook page and uh, have a look at the pictures and, or, or videos on YouTube. You're going to love it. They, they love it. And they learn how to protect the environment. It's, uh, I think this is the most important thing. We're not going to change people that are like 60, 70. Oh, even those, they can change. But um, it's good to grow up 
With that respect. For With the, that respect, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is Pandelis Ioana and Fivos Papa Cristoforo from the Cyprus Freshwater Angling Association. If you look for them on Facebook, they're very quick at responding if you message them. They've even got phone numbers there. Or you can join them on the 21st of January at Yermasoya Dam, just north of Limassol. And I'm sure that if you contact them, they will be more than happy to welcome you to that damn cleanup. And no, I wasn't swearing. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries, where we found something we didn't know existed. Well, as we start another year in Cyprus, I thought we'd catch up with our friends at BirdLife Cyprus. 2017 wasn't a brilliant year for our feathered friends, but there are a couple of things in the offing that may be of interest to you. Natalie Stiliano from BirdLife Cyprus joins us. Natalie, let's talk first of all about the app that I think you launched last summer, and that was to help people not only understand about migrating birds, and I'm sure you'll explain in a moment, but also to give them the opportunity to anonymously report incidents they saw of illegal bird trapping. Um, that's right. We launched our app, which is called uh, Feather Journeys. It's available both for Android and Apple devices, for phones and tablets. And the idea behind this application is to allow people who become aware of incidents of illegal bird killing or trapping to be able to report this. They can download the application and uh, by opening it, they can choose to report this incident. They can choose depending if what they've seen or heard are calling devices or mist nets or lime sticks or somebody illegally shooting and supplies with information. We receive the GPS coordinates of the incident that they've reported to us and we then report it to the competent authorities, safeguarding of course the anonymity of the person who's reported this to us. Now it was introduced last summer, mm -hmm. so I suppose at the moment maybe there aren't that many users. How do you get it out there so that more people simply have it on their phones and when they're walking around the countryside they might think, hello, that's a bit strange and want to report something? Well, every opportunity we get, uh, we like to share this with people that this tool is available uh, because it's very easy to use and um, very direct. I suppose that because it's still relatively new, you haven't been able to assess what use it's been. Have people reported incidents? Yes, we actually have had quite a few reports through the application, which is very encouraging for us. And we hope that they continue. I mean, we launched it early in the summer. And as we all know, the main trapping season is autumn. So it was shortly before the first sort of main trapping season. So with time, we hope that more be people become aware of this tool and use it to share this information with us when they're aware. You get a report, you've got the GPS coordinates, you pass it on to the relevant authorities, mm -hmm. but they presumably have other things to do as well and can't just drop everything and run to the relevant place. If it's misnetting, I suppose those are in situ, like lime sticks, so that mm -hmm, it can be followed right. up at a later date. But if it's illegal shooting, people have usually gone, haven't they? Um, that's right. I mean, for uh, misnets and lime sticks and also potentially calling devices, it's easier 
so to speak, <laughs> to report and then for the competent authorities to find these uh, later when they go check. But we don't want to discourage anybody from also reporting illegal shooting. It's very important also for us to know and to be able to report it. Again, presumably, hunters tend to know where are the good areas for game, even if they're illegal. So you can assume that if it was good last Sunday, they'll go back this Sunday sort of thing. Um, this I'm not in a position to <laughs> to say anything about. But, I mean, illegal shooting does not only I mean could be in a game reserve area that somebody's shooting birds, or it could also be species that are not game species. So there's many things that need to be <laughs> looked out for. But also in our application, you can find links to the Game and Fauna Service website where you can find the hunting maps. So if somebody's uncertain whether um, something they've seen is in a game reserve area or in a hunting area, they can consult this. And OK, so it, it's an educational tool as well. Yes. And tell me about the part where it says, if you were a migrating bird, would you yes. survive the journey? What's that all about? <laughs> that part of the application is based on a board game that we developed with funding from NABU and the Heinz Zielmann Foundation, which we took to schools. And we've seen that we've had a very positive response from children and from educators. And we thought it would be nice to be able to make this accessible to even more people. So um, we were able to include this in the application. Obviously, not in exactly the same format, but as it would be in an application where somebody can try their luck as a migratory bird. So you start in uh, spring trying to go to your breeding areas. And of course, on your journey, you might find many obstacles and threats, but also things that might help you in your journey. Once you've reached your destination, this bird will breed and then it will return starting in autumn to its wintering ground. So it's two parts of the journey that one needs to complete. OK, and let's come on to the competition that's running, I think, until the end of January or possibly even a little bit later. What's that about? So our competition is called Wild for Nature and it's addressed to young people aged 15 to 25. And the idea is that we want to get everybody outside and exploring nature. So this competition is for the creative mapping of a natural area. Basically, we want people to go out, explore, and make a map of their experience out in nature. This map can be anything they want. It can be a collage, it can be prints from the area, it can be video, it can be sound. It can be a painting, it can be a little sculpture. I mean, we're open <laughs> to any interpretation of people's experience. And can it be any area or particular areas that you're looking for? And we're, we've restricted, in a way, the competition. This is probably the only restriction that we have to the important bird areas that we have in Cyprus. And people who are interested to learn more about these areas and to find all the relevant documents for the competition can go to wildfornature.birdlifecyprus.org and they can find all the information there and hopefully also some inspiration. Right, and there's two categories. You've divided the ages, I think, That's and lots right. of prizes. Yes. So the categories we have, the first category is 15 to 18, and the second is 19 to 25. And everybody who enters a competition can win prizes of over 1,500 euros, which include binoculars and books about nature and many other prizes, and also the possibility to take part in an exhibition in spring. We've been talking to Natalie Stiljanou from BirdLife Cyprus, and let's hope 2018 proves to be a better year for the birds on our island. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.